Well, that was a that was a cracking win though. Um, Armenia are a great side, I must say. You know, that's why we lost them. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's enough small talk. Uh, I think there's no one waiting in the in the virtual waiting room. Oh no, there is. There's a few people there, so we'll just let them in and then we'll uh, we'll start. So apologies for that uh, terrible banter, folks. We we're just trying to fill the air, but it's great to see so many people um, popping in the chat there saying hello. So hello all. Um, that's fantastic. Great to see you. Come on, Carl from Nottingham even from Cornwall, hello from Hamilton, that's brilliant, um, fantastic, so folks, for those of you who, who don't know, my name is Luke, I'm the, the uh, <clears throat> manager of the W Club here at the, the Whiskey Shop, the role I've been in since January, this is our sixth or seventh tasting, and they keep getting growing in size and, and, and demand each time, so that's great to see even more of you uh, keep joining, so please do keep it up, I hope you like the, uh, this is one of our first packs with the new uh, pack design, so I hope you enjoy that, and we're always trying to kind of improve these and make them better. So, um, so thank you. And I hope you all received them okay. Um, so, but anyway, you didn't come here to, to listen to me waffle on. You came here to listen to Caffel, uh, Callum waffle on. <laughs> so Callum, <laughs> do you want to tell us a bit about yourself uh, before we start? So my name's Callum Fraser. Um, I have now 15 years experience, 16 years experience in the drinks industry. Uh, I started as a bartender in Edinburgh uh, and from a relatively young age, uh, I have adored whiskey. Um, I was bottling my own whiskey at the age of 19 or 20 when it was uh, kind of a grey area, whether that was a legal thing to do or not without a specific licence for that sort of thing. Uh, they changed it from a grey area to a very black and white area and I stopped that fairly soon afterwards. But um, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, there's not many, not many 19 year olds who have sort of two or three casks in storage, but that was it. That was the type of person I was. Uh, I worked predominantly in Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, running various bars and restaurants, including uh, helping the Balmoral Bar set up Scotch, uh, their, their phenomenal uh, whiskey bar they have there. And then four years ago, started work with William Grant and Sons, uh, where I actually started on rum, um, another, another absolute passion of mine. Um, but uh, very, very quickly, I got moved on to the innovation brands, which includes wonderful, wonderful Ailsa Bay, which we're talking about this evening. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a journey and it's been a lot of fun, but I, I, I love what I do. I've got absolutely one of the best jobs out there, getting to, to speak to people about wonderful spirits and, uh, and yeah, it's, uh, you don't really have many, many duds at William Grant and Sons. They, they are, uh, a, a phenomenal company and, and each one of the spirits we produce are, are pretty tip top. Fantastic. No, that's brilliant. And we're, we're obviously going to try one of them um, today. And this is a really unique opportunity to kind of uh, dissect and delve in. Um, uh, but before we start on our first whiskey, um, do you want to give us uh, the lineup uh, so that people can kind of prepare their kind of glassware and, and that kind of thing? Uh, and while they're doing that, folks, for those of you who this is your first tasting joining us, uh, we do want to hear your tasting notes, your chat. This, we want these to be as interactive as possible. We, we, because of the volume of people on and because we're recording this, uh, which is why we don't have everyone just chatting away on mute, but we want people to be engaging in the in the chat box um you know despite the terrible football banter uh you know we're not we're not sports focused if that's not your thing don't be don't be shy uh or running away so Callum, what order are we going to go in we're going to you're starting with the hudson bay baby quarter cask i believe we are we're going to start with the hudson quarter cask uh, and we're going to move gradually more a little bit more smoky a little bit more peaty as we go um so after the the quarter cask from hudson we're going to move on to the virgin oak and then we're going to move on to the first fill bourbon the refill bourbon, and then finally our, our complete Ilsa Bay sweet smoke experience. Um, and yeah, if anybody, you know, sort of, if you're if you're pouring these out in glasses or if you have these out in front of you at the moment, you'll notice a massive discrepancy in colour between, you know, sort of specifically the virgin oak to the refill bourbon. Um, there's going to be a whole load of different flavour profiles coming across here. There's going to be yeah, some really interesting stuff. So this is this is always a really wonderful. I haven't actually done this tasting in quite some time, so uh, to be able to get some of this through the through the door again and, and be doing a tasting like this again is is really really wonderful. Um, this is a, a really great lineup of uh, cask strength uh, whiskies. In saying that, they are all cask strength whiskies, apart from your final uh, sweet smoke, but even that is at forty eight percent, forty nine percent. So yeah, don't be afraid to put some water in there. Um, yeah, there's a, there's like there's a good drop of whiskey in front of everybody this evening. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very aware tomorrow is still a school day. 
uh, don't don't make us thinking about tomorrow at this stage. Come on, we want to forget the <laughs> forget the troubles for the next forty five minutes to an hour at least. So, do you want to tell us about this this Hudson cask? Absolutely. So, uh, one of the one of the wonderful things about uh, William Grant's Sons is that not only do we have a wealth of distilling experience behind us, but we also also have a wealth of distilleries. We we can sort of beg, borrow, and steal from all sorts of different places, uh, and not just sort of physical items, but ideas, and you know, sort of play with those things. Um, Hudson is is one of the few uh, distilleries that William Grant Sons actually purchased. Most of the distilleries we, we created from scratch. We'll hear a little bit about that in a second. But um, but Hudson Hudson we we purchased, and uh, I think that was in sort of the early two thousands. And one of the things that Hudson do that is pretty unique is this uh, uh, baby bourbon, uh, which is maturation in really really small casks. And when I say really small, these casks seem to be anywhere from about 25 litres to about 100 litres, which is probably, you know, sort of a tenth of the size um, of, you know, sort of like those classic big sort of uh, ex-bourbon casks that you, that you see. Um, so this is really small maturation. And this is the first cask that Ailsa Bay will go into. So before it touches anything else, it will specifically go into these fodder casks. You have to think about this as the opposite of cast finishing. William Grant and Sons were the first uh, were the, were the first distillery to do cast finishing, to put the whiskey into something else, you know, sort of the, your single malt to put, put it into something else um, before, before sort of releasing it. We're now pioneering cask starting, and this gives the whiskey just a real boost, a real head start in the aging process and get some really interesting flavors in there really early on. If you knows it, the first thing, first thing that gets me especially being aware of what we're going to and specifically the, the sweet smoke at the end. First thing that gets me is the sweetness. The second thing that gets me is a bit of a lack of peat, a little bit of a lack of smoke. This is not a particularly smoky drop, uh, which is why we're kind of starting with it. We're going to ease everybody in really, really nicely. But to, to just nose it, you're immediately getting those those sort of ex-bourbon notes, but you're getting them in a really sort of full way. This this gives a sweetness backbone to the to the final end product. You're gonna get coconut in there, you're gonna get loads of vanillin. Um, so just loads and loads of vanilla. But yeah, that's uh, the the striking thing for me is uh, the absence almost of smoke. Mm. Uh, Christy, I'm very, very sorry. Uh, you have two refill American instead of one Hudson uh, uh, sample. Yeah, um, you are you are missing this, unfortunately. Um, I've just dropped uh, Christy a, a message um, okay. privately there, and I can see um, Chris has a has a similar issue. So um, I'll, I'll get on to Chris there. So so apologies about that, um, Chris and Christy. Um, the, there was another question um, further back while we kind of di dissect the flavors in this, because we do want to hear everyone's tasting notes, um, was about the age of these casks. Um, and Brian also asked, is there a chance of getting a cask number shared? So I have neither cask number, actually. Let me just double check that. No, I, I neither cask number, and I, I definitely don't have age um, the definitions for these. Um, they are all relatively young. You can kind of tell that by the ABV on them, anywhere between 58 and what do we got? 62 and a half. Um, they will be going into cask anywhere between 58 and so 68. Uh, so these are going to be young samples. These have not spent a lot of time, but the distillery itself really only opened in 2007. So we don't have anything with a great deal of age to it um, uh, in, in the offing, uh, no matter what. These are going to all going to be on the younger side. I would suspect these are all uh, in cask, specifically for the for the for the Hudson. Um, these are in Hudson barrels between three months and three years. Um, so you're going to get nothing uh, older than three years here. I would suspect. I would suspect this has had a decent amount of time in cask. It is really really flavoursome. Yeah, uh, Steve saying loads of coconut, loads of salt and pepper. Absolutely. Martin and Lorraine asking uh, <laughs> if they combine a small drop of each whiskey will it potentially end up something remotely resembling. Not even I know the ratios um, for uh, for bringing everything together to the to the Hudson. Um, and, and once everything is, is in together, it'll be uh, maturated again. It'll be left again to to sort of uh, bring it bring everything together. So uh, unlikely. I mean, 
you feel free to have a go. It's always a lot of fun. Um, once again, we'll talk about it in a second, but uh, Hudson, uh, LCBA sits on the same site as Hendrix and they sort of play around with that, the Hen Hendrix distillery as well. Um, but I've been in there and you know, so like you'll never get the right ratio of each gin to, to create something like Hendrix, but, um, but it's always a lot of fun trying. Mm. On the palate, that's really, really, really beautiful. It's almost a little bit, uh, a little bit of honey in there, a little bit leathery. And then on the finish, yeah, that salted caramel on the finish, just really, really sweet. Um, and as you, as you go on, you'll see how important that sweetness is because mm. something like the refill bourbon that we're going to go to last is going to be completely lacking in that sweetness. So to really balance out that whole sweet smoke element, we we need that sweetness in the whiskey really early on, and it's going to have it's going to have a real big impact at the end. Yeah, we definitely we've got some great tasting notes coming in there from Steve says. Lots of coconut, loads of coconut, salt and pepper. I totally agree. And Phil says lots of vanilla and a slight astringency too. Um, Gareth and Annette say they needed a drop of water um, with this one, but sometimes that's not bad. I mean, it is 58.6%, so um, that's not bad going. Um, Brian agrees with your salted caramel. Definitely there is that, um, almost reminded me of those uh, like salted toffees like um, that you get, like kind of seaside treats kind yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, and Gary gets burnt sugar. So, so definitely, I think they're all kind of tie into that caramel kind of flavoring as well. Um, so no, it's, 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 it's really, really interesting. Nice. Wonderful. So I've mentioned a couple of times a little bit about Gervin. Gervin sits about uh, an hour south of here, south of Glasgow. Um, so it's, it's not too far from the border of England. Uh, and one of the immediate things that you'll notice about, about the spirits in front of you, if you're nosing any of them is, this is this is a, a very much a lowland malt, but very not in that classic lowland style. Um, for for us, at William Gatton Sons, that those, those classic whiskey regions are a really nice way to sort of base your understanding of whiskey on. But they're becoming less and less relevant, sort of as 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 the years go on. Uh, you know, sort of you look at something like uh, a Balbeni with week of peat. You know, sort of you've got a lovely Speyside malt there now playing with peat in the same way that the you know sort of like the traditional. Uh, Isla malts would do, um, and then you've got Isla malts that are that are doing things you know, so like completely untraditional with the way that they do it normally. Um, so, Ilse Bay came sort of born from from the want of the William Grant and Sons family, and we are still family owned. Uh, I believe we're sixth generation now, seventh generation. Um, so yeah, still the family of of William Grant. Um, but it came from a want for for a for a distillery that could do uh, it could do that classic Peter style. It's it's something that isn't really found in the rest of our portfolio. You know, sort of isn't in Glenfiddich or Balvenie. Um, but the the site itself had an entirely different purpose originally. If you go to if you go to the Garvin site ever, there is Hendrix Distillery there, which is wonderful. There is uh, our, our Ilsa Distillery there. There is just a ridiculous amount of uh, aging whiskey in warehouses, and we'll get to it. Um, but there's also our massive, massive grain distillery. So if you've ever had uh, uh, pat the patent still uh, malts, uh, uh, sorry, single grains, um, then th that is that is where it's all made. And that came from a, a disagreement um, when willing grandsons, willing grandsons have always liked to, to push boundaries. And uh, we were the first whiskey company to advertise on television, and that caused a massive fallout in the whiskey industry because it was a it was a it was a, an agreement between the different uh, distillers that that no one was going to advertise on telly. Uh, Jay saying the the Hudson cask is where there's original but spicy. I like that. It really tasting like notes of the night so far, I must say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so 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 William Grant Sons uh, were uh, decided to advertise on telly. And um, and the the distillers, uh, the, the main distillers at the time, where we would get our grain for from for for Grant's whiskey, decided to stop supplying us um, because they deemed that it was too commercial a thing to do, and they no longer wanted to deal with William Grant and Sons. That company became Diageo, which is a really interesting contrast to that stance about 40, 50 years ago. So we built a, a grain distillery, a massive, massive grain distillery, in about nine months. Um, to to make sure that we still had our supply of grain, and that site has has grown ever since. 
Um, it used to be a munitions factory during the war, so everything that has ever been made in that site in one form or another could blow up, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> over the years, we've, we've just added that. As I said, we, we started uh, Hendrix there in 1999. We built Ailsa Bay there in 2007, and the sheer mass of whiskey there is unbelievable. So Ailsa Bay itself um, is, is, believe it or not, the fourth largest distillery in Scotland, uh, single malt distillery in Scotland. Uh, we can produce about 12 million litres of spirit per annum. Uh, and on the site, we have 48 warehouses, all stacked about 10 cask high. Uh, and it's about 10% of all ageing whisky in Scotland is at the site in Durban. Now, that's not just Elsa Bay. That's a lot of William Grant Sun stock uh, that would otherwise be in Dufton. Uh, but it's also a lot of stock for, for other distilleries because distilleries like to diversify where they keep their stock uh, just in case they have an absolute disaster in, in their one individual site. Um, so we've got whiskey from, from all over Scotland aging there. But if, um, if we were to put it all in cask, uh, sorry, put it all in bottle tomorrow, we'd have to pay the chance of the Exchequer about nine billion pounds overnight. That is it just in tax, just in quite, that's quite the windfall tax there. That it solves the, solve the cost of living yeah, crisis. Yeah, could, could, you know, we, I'd probably take that under advisement. Um, but it's an absolutely massive, massive site. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, so since we're talking about casks, probably worth moving on to cask number two, our virgin oak. Um, on um, our site, just before it, we go, we move on there because yeah. obviously we've we've touched on it, um, but. There's a few people commenting on on adding water, um, so I just wanted to get your your ideas on, on what's been said and also the ratios of that. Because Carl says he finds a, finds a drop of water turns up the creaminess and softens the sweet sweetness. Um, Alan there says with water more spice. It's he finds it even more spicy than the fieriness you would have get from the the higher ABV, which is which is really interesting. Be interested to see if anyone else has had that uh, that experience. Um, what was your as we because obviously all all the next three are, are well they're all kind of above what you'd expect from an abv and obviously four kind of full-on cast strengths what's your kind of general advice in terms of water moving forward with these i like to try it both ways i like i like i like both um with water especially with whiskies at higher abv your texture will absolutely change um because something that's you know 60 61 percent is going to be really high in ethanol will be uh, uh, really really high in esters and such um you're going to have a, a really sort of light note you know sort of if you've, if you've ever had anything straight off the still it almost evaporates on your tongue because it's just so, so high in, in alcohol um it, it dissipates before you even get to swallow so if you if you add water in it will make it a little bit rounder. It will make it a little bit richer. I always think about um, sort of almost like a uh, like a graph with just different peaks on it. And um, if you add a little bit of water, it might dull down the, the highest peak, but that allows the, the rest to sort of come into come into focus and come into level. Um, so it, it really depends on each individual uh, spirit and each individual sort of palate uh, as to as to how you like it. I would definitely try it both ways, so and, and sort of determine for yourself. Um, a, a little drop can can make a lot of difference. I was actually uh, playing with cocktails with another brand today and talking about uh, dilution ratios. And I had a I've got a small child and I've got one of those uh, little pipettes for his uh, for his calpol. I've got a drawer full of them, but they're brilliant because they give you measurements from one mil to five mil. So we're talking about individual dilution ratios of anything between like sort of fifteen and twenty percent for these cocktails, trying to pre-batch them. And I'm adding literally a milliliter at a time using this little pipette. And, uh, and you can really get that sort of granular with it, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, uh, I would say bring it down to a level you're comfortable with, bring it down to a level where you enjoy the experience. And um, there's no point in trying to force yourself to drink, especially when we come, I mentioned it a couple of times, but the refill bourbon. Refill bourbon is uh, got some really sort of punchy notes to it. Um, and a little bit of water, a lot of water um, will make that a little bit uh, a little bit more palatable if it's not to your palate. Mm -hmm. Perfect. No, I think that that answers. So we're we're, we're coming on to the to the virgin oak um, next. Um, the color so, yeah. is the color difference straight away is 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 no color difference. Mm. Absolutely. Um, on on site uh, at uh, Duff and, and sorry in Girvan, uh, we have a, a cooperage there. Uh, everybody in the in the cooperage, I think they produce twenty two barrels a week in terms of. Uh, in terms of stripping them down and uh, basically rebuilding them. Um, it's absolutely, absolutely amazing. Uh, now, given that we put 11,000 casks into warehouse, I believe, every uh, every week, 
and these guys are producing 22 tasks each, you can see that they're not all coming from Ilsa, obviously. Um, but yeah, the, the amazing job these guys do, loads, hundreds of years of experience combined, um, allow us to, to have this wonderful, wonderful sort of virgin oak and, and uh, oak that we've basically stripped down and, and, and reused. Um, or just completely new casks they built from scratch. It's, there's not too many distilleries out there anymore that have their own cooperage. Um, so we're very lucky to have it, very skilled gentlemen. But this is, uh, immediately you're gonna get, sort of, and this sounds really daft, but you're gonna get woody notes from it. You're gonna get, you know, sort of like that classic inside of a cask. This is, this is as, as classic a, a, a whiskey finish as you're going to get. Um, what is gone is, a fair whack of that sweetness, a, a, a fair amount, and, and what has replaced it is a light sort of campfire smoke. Uh, a couple of comments saying a little bit of uh, uh, heavily charred casks, not really heavily charred casks. This is coming from the spirit. This is coming from the from the peat that is that is within the spirit. Mm. Mm. It's got a, it's got an extraordinary, almost like as Roger mentions in the the chat about the the syrup, like it's got that that honeycomb sap syrup um kind of sweetness on the nose as well as as you mentioned that that wood like it's it's a it's an interesting nose all right yeah uh on the palate it's a really interesting combination of sort of it's quite rich but then dries really really quickly um this color is absolutely from the virgin oak uh as you'll see um next to the refill bourbon you know so like the refill bourbon is is made in a, in a very similar way but if, i wonder if the camera there we go so that is a re the refill bourbon and the virgin oak sort of side by side. If you ever if you ever uh, sort of drink something like uh, Ardbeg, Ardbeg comes out this color, uh, which is just always blows my mind. They're they're looking for a really light touch to the to the to the spirit, whereas this this is going to have loads of uh, loads of impact and it, and it looks uh, a couple of people have said it, it feels very similar to the to the end product and you're absolutely right it really does. Um, this is this is probably going to have the most impact on on the flavor of the end product, other than sweetness that comes from the Hudson cask. So this is uh, this is absolutely something that's going to have a, a real impact, and just because it got that much interaction with the with the wood, and you can see that in the color, you can feel that in the flavor. As I said, there there's a there's a bit of campfire smoke. That's going to become more prevalent as we go on. And the campfire smoke is really, really important to us. So when we built the distillery, when we were looking to, to create something, it was a, a really unique opportunity because we weren't purchasing anything. We weren't creating anything or, or uh, weren't taking anything that already had a, a flavor profile. You know, sort of if someone was to buy Glenfiddich tomorrow and they were to try and change the flavor profile from that apple and pear, that classic, you know, sort of things that you immediately associate with Glenfiddich that runs right the way through the spirit range. Um, you, they wouldn't get away with it. It has to stay true to, to the identity of the distillery and the, the identity of, you know, sort of those, those spirits that have gone before. But in starting from scratch, we weren't only sort of able to build the distillery to scratch to our own specifications using 120 years of distilling knowledge, which is phenomenal. Um, but we were able to, to build a flavor profile from scratch to something that we really particularly felt passionate about and wanted. So we went out and looked for, uh, for um, peat, not just sort of in the classic places in Scotland you look for peat, we went out and looked globally. Uh, so we, we looked in, in uh, an Isla, obviously, yeah, in traditional home. Um, we looked in England, I dare to say. Um, we looked in the Congo. I know there was peat samples taken from the Congo. So somewhere in a William Grant's library somewhere is some uh, peat in uh, peat smoked distilled whiskey, um, which is amazing. Um, but what we settled on was peat from the northeast of Scotland, which is very, very different from peat from the islands in the west coast. Um, and that's why you get campfire, because it's rich in sort of fern and it's rich in, in wood. Uh, as opposed to sort of the iodine heavy west coast that's uh, sort of like, you know, if you go to the, if you go to the islands, there isn't many trees there because there's no shelter, there's no protection, so the elements just take everything. Um, so that's why your peat tastes in a really specific way, it tastes of, you know, sort of salty or brine of, you know, sort of really sort of a harsh earth, you know, sort of, a, you know, like a harsh environment, it's a harsh environment, 
whereas the northeast you've got a lot more um you've got a lot more shelter you've got a lot more sort of undulation you've got a lot more um sort of in interesting foliage and that has an effect on the flavor that comes through and that has an effect on the flavor that comes through in our whiskey so we're not getting the iodine tcp heavy notes that you would associate with some peated whiskey you know sort of everybody's everybody's had that experience or everybody's certainly in my background in bartending when i met somebody that didn't like peated whiskey they sort of went oh i had a really bad experience because the first peated whiskey i tried was you know sort of a 10 year old with freud and 10 year old with freud is lovely but it's not how i'd introduce somebody to peated whiskey um whereas something like this um specifically from the virgin oak it's a little bit lighter it's a little bit um you know sort of toasted marshmallow um, and it's sort of, it's, it's a little bit gentler to introduce, introduce somebody to it. No, I like the idea of someone who's not used to drinking Peter whiskey, give them a 62.5% ABV whiskey instead. Um, <laughs> yeah. Actually, no problem with that. <laughs> the, the, I suppose with, it's with Peter, it's also whether you have a, uh, your brain can kind of place that, that turf phenol, um, previous to having it in whiskey. Cause if you've, you know, been around a turf fire or you've experienced it through other things, your kind of brain logically knows what it is you know a lot of people who come from countries um or parts of the world where you wouldn't in you know experience peat smoke um it's it's totally alien like i know when we when we'd go abroad from where i'm from on holidays as a kid um visiting family in england or something and when you fly back in at home and you're in the car driving from the airport to the house we knew we were coming home because as you come over the cork carry mountains you get hit with that smell in the air of the of people burning turf like you know smell that you're always around uh, but for people who aren't around that, the first, um, you know, the first interaction is where their brain goes is ashtray or, you know, the, you know, negative feelings around smoke because their their brain can't place it. I know when we used to do uh, whiskey classes back in Ireland, if you have a bit of peated barley and get, get someone to eat the malted peated barley, because it's quite chocolatey when it's before it's distilled. Mm. And then suddenly their brain's like, oh, I get this. And then it 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 kind of it all works. Um, we've got some absolutely cracking um, tasting notes coming in from from cough syrup um the stuff you couldn't stop drinking as a child mm -hmm. um to uh ian says uh still get the uh sweetness like cider toffee but spicy and peppery um jay's like almost like a high proof rum maybe a shoe polish note to it there was someone else's hard hardwood varnish uh, and sugar so hardwood and shoe polish the two things you want from your drink yeah um definitely <laughs> these do you know what, do you know what, uh, i i have down leathery like that is not a bad tasting note you know the, these are Certainly, sorry, shoe polish smells amazing. Like I'm totally <laughs> no, right does, yeah. that. Um, yeah, no, th th these are absolutely archetypal sort of notes that you you'd expect from from something that's got a little bit of sulfur in it, a little bit of peat in it. You know, sort of these are uh, very very savoury notes. So we don't necessarily associate with you know sort of a lot of of foods out there. You know, sort of you know a little bit of, of smoked fish and things like that. Um, yeah, our brains naturally go to right. What sort of more sort of chemically does this link to and we you have you know it's like sort of smell and flavor is a, is a wonderful thing and you know it's like we all know it opens up memories but also trying to describe a flavor to somebody that hasn't had something before as you were just saying there uh, like it's, it's it's impossible to do it without that flavor lexicon that's you know sort of to to describe a peated single malt without you know sort of and without somebody having a having a vague idea of what it is so so difficult so yeah our brains work in really strange ways to try and sort of describe these flavors that we're that we're experiencing uh so i, I love all these i love all the, the tasting notes that, that people sort of come at me with uh, whether it's this or sort of other spirits that, that i'll work with it's uh, it's always wonderful to see how people's brains work mm -hmm. yeah no a hundred percent uh that's why we love the the my favorite part of these tastings is when everyone gives their their tasting notes. Um, the Martin and Lorraine say very nice whiskey, lovely lasting, uh, smoky, spicy finish with an oaky aftertaste. Um, David says, I think water ruins the lovely sweet smoke balance, which is interesting because, yeah, I mean, I thought I was just thinking that the water really opened this up for me um, because it is just a bit punchy on the finish with, with, with the higher ABV. It's it's the higher ABV and it's also the spice from the virgin oak. If you leave something in virgin oak for a long, long period of time, uh, it's gonna get real spicy. I, I had um, had a fairly old Glenfiddich, sort of twenty years plus. Uh, once I was very lucky to try that was a single cask, but it'd been in virgin oak for for all that time, and it was nigh on. It, it wasn't. It was a shall we say a flavor explosion. I wouldn't say it's nigh on sort of that I couldn't drink it. It, it was wonderful, but it, but it just filled filled with spice. 
Um, and yeah, that, that spice is all going to come through specifically on the virgin oak, a little bit on the first bill bourbon as well. We're going to get it. We're going to get a heck of a lot of spice. Um, so yeah, it's that, that virgin oak, um, that, that, um, you know, sort of that new wood, um, has got so much flavor to give, uh, and you're going to get all of it. Uh, if you, if you leave it in, if you leave a, a, a whiskey in there for, for too, too long. Yeah, uh, we got a, some, more, some more great questions there. Um, Brian, I know we discussed ages and, and how long these have been aged for in the last cast, but uh, Brian's asked again, would you give a rough guesstimate how, you, how long you reckon this is in the cask for? I, this is not going to take a lot, of, as much as the, the colour is going to say, say that it's been in there a while, um, it's not going to take a lot of time to get this amount of colour. It's 62.5, even if this is bottled at uh, 68, which is the highest we, uh, sorry, if we, put it in cask at 68, which is the highest we put it in. You know, your angels share, you know, sort of what, what are you losing? Uh, sort of your, your ABV per year, I know in volume, I don't necessarily know ABV, um, but it's not going to be in there for much more than sort of three or four years. Um, so what is the, what's the, because that's another question that's come in there in terms of what the the cask, what, what the cask strength is, what the fill strength is, I suppose. Um, so we uh, we have three separate fill strengths. Uh, one is at uh, 55, one at 63, and one at 68. Mm -hmm. uh, so hence it being even more difficult to uh, to, to, to guesstimate ages. Uh, Brian doesn't like to make things easy. <laughs> uh, well, Chris says mixing the version with the Hudson works great. Um, mm. Steve says, yeah. uh, going back to the quarter cast now, I can really get the sweetness, penny sweets and licorice when compared to the virgin oak. Um, if you like licorice, we're about to hit some. Uh, yes. There's going to be a little bit of licorice in the next one. Going to be a little bit of almost sulfur actually in the next one as well. Um, so yeah, so there's there's. I love that the, there'll be sort of little threads that people will be able to take from the first one to the last one because this is all going to be the the same liquid as much as Ilsa. So we when we built the distillery we built it to be the most technologically advanced distillery we physically could in 2007 the whole distillery is ran by one person from a bank of computer screens um there's nobody else on site when i go there's me and the person at the computer screens it's a very very strange distillery when when you're used to being around even things like sort of glenfiddich because people milling around and stuff like that to have almost the same volume of liquid going out by having one person pulling it all and if he's watching if he ever sees us back I know that Craig, who does a lot of that at the distillery, will wish me to point out that he also runs one of the distilleries down the road as well from the same bank of screens. I'm aware, <laughs> um, but he uh, he always he, 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 anytime anybody anytime I have anybody in the room, he'll, he'll make sure he points out. Yeah, that one's also running the one down there. Um, sounds like um, sounds like Tesco's dream, you know, the self service checkouts, like you know, yeah. just a distillery ran by by one fella. Yeah. Now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it is absolutely the most uh, technologically advanced distillery that we can. Uh, we can do lots of different things with the stills. The stills themselves are modelled on Balvenie, um, but the way that we've incorporated the stills, the, the tech that we've used, the tech that we've used are from various, various different fields. You know, so the brewing, um, you know, so like the washbacks and stuff, the brewing techniques that we use are from Krones in Germany. And uh, Krones in Germany do all the big European brewers. Uh, so anybody making brew uh, and making beer in the continent, any big brewers on the continent are going to use Crohn's because they are the tip top. They've not been used in malt whiskey before because, you know, sort of nobody's really gone to that extent. But we use them in malt whiskey because they're the best at what they do. And when you're making malt whiskey, essentially what you're doing and with, you know, it's like your, your, your initial brewing is, is making a beer. So we got Crohn's to do that. Some of the some of the tech that we've used for the distilling and um, for the uh, for the cut points and stuff like that are used in oil and gas because they use the most uh, sort of um, cutting edge technology for that. Uh, and then the the stills themselves, we've taken uh, obviously shape of the valve any, but we've also taken uh, skills that they use in, in some of the newer distilleries in Japan, stuff like that. Um, so we've we've taken little bits from from lots lots of different areas and lots of different uh, technologies, which is really really cool. Um, and yeah, so we can, as much as this is, I say this is this is one spirit, and we'll find a thread through it all. Um, there's actually sort of four different spirits within this. Uh, we we do different as as all distilleries will. We'll do sort of peated runs and non peated runs, but we can actually physically change the characteristic. And um, we produce sort of five or six different styles of malt. 
uh, at Ailsa. So um, yeah, there's lots of different things that we can do, lots of different ways that we can play with it, which is amazing. Um, the, the microscopic cuts that we can make is honestly second to none in the, in the Scotch whisky uh, industry. Um, we can use, um, we can switch from uh, steel condensers to copper condensers to the press of a button, which really nobody else can do. Um, you know, copper will give you a little bit more sulfur in your mix and uh, steel will give, make, make a little bit cleaner. Um, but yeah, we've uh, we've got a lot of different things that we can do, and you know, so like elements you can play with. Um, to give us a really complex malt for what is a relatively young spirit. Um, but yeah, so that all started from the from the point of licorice. We'll we'll find a little bit of licorice going right the way through. Well, it sounds like with the with the distillery, that you're you know you're one step away from that that situation where that fellow recently who reverse engineered the whiskey through from proteins and enzymes or whatever to to recreate the flavor of a bourbon. You know, <laughs> that's the next step. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> Gray Maxwell actually in the chat earlier on because this is a, a good segue. Said I remember being visited to the uh, <clears throat> remember from a visit to the site around ten years ago. That the complex has an excellent green credentials. Could you talk a bit more about the the saving the environment and that? So yeah, we're an, we're an energy neutral site, uh, which is uh, all the rage just now, but we've been doing it from day one in 2007. Uh, William Grant and Sons is, as a whole is, is relatively, uh, well, I say relatively, I can't say too much, but uh, yes, we are energy neutral as a company. Um, uh, but as a site, yeah, we're energy neutral um, from even inside the site, uh, a, a third of the, the heat, uh, even just the heat that we produce is uh, brought back in and, and, and reused. Um, but yes, we are uh, extremely energy efficient and uh, nothing really goes to waste on site. We, we manage to, everything that is, that is left over, we manage to create energy from. So um, we're, we're pretty much a leading light. Once again, the, the advantage of building a distillery from scratch with a lot, of, uh, a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. This is uh, impressive. You're energy neutral and labor cost neutral. This is... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's everything uh, good flavor neutral. <laughs> um, brilliant. So, do you want to come on to the to the licorice, the first fill bourbon cask? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, as I said, a little bit of licorice in here, a little bit of um, sort of uh, toffee, almost fudge, and um, but also a little bit of sulfur. Um, I'm actually going to give this a shake. I think this was um, so. I've got I've got uh, for this sampling. I have got samples of the the same samples that you guys have but i also have sort of older samples of the same range i've done this tasting before and uh yeah the first fill bourbon is always one that i really really like and always one that kind of changes and that's kind of understandable because it's had something in the cast previously you know no two casts are going to be the same so all these casts should change um but i think the first fill bourbon is the one that that sort of fluctuates the most and, and kind of gets the most interesting characters. If I was going to give somebody one of these to drink on their own, I would personally probably lean towards the quarter cask because I think it's a really beautiful Moorish malt. Probably a little bit too sweet for my palate, um, but I think that would be the one that I'd introduce people to. But for me, I really like this. Ripe bananas, absolutely. Philip on the on the chat, right, almost over ripe bananas. That little bit of sulphur. When it's just gone a little bit too far, you're going to get that. It's like lockdown one all over again. Mm. <laughs> mm. On the palate, really, really classic. Peated single malt whiskey. Really, really beautiful. Once again, that drying note uh, might be something to do with the ABV, but, uh, but yeah, quite, quite dry in the finish potentially thereby designed to uh, to balance out the sweetness from the from the Hudson to give you both of that in the final product. A little bit of vanilla coming through, a little bit of licorice still, plenty of spice there. Mm. And on the finish, just a little bit, little bit of stone fruit, a little bit of pear, uh, yeah, a little bit of pear, a little bit of apple, and um, that's if you uh, if you are a Glenfiddich drinker, that should sort of set off a few bells for you. So we have the same master distiller as Glenfiddich. We have uh, Brian Kinsman, who is absolutely phenomenal at what he does. And if you're ever in a room with him, just pick his brain because his brain is phenomenal. Um, but yeah, he has 
basically complete control over this. We have 12 stills on site uh, and two of them um, are now completely sort of zoned off to do experiment experimentation uh, throughout the entire year. Um, just things Brian wants to play around with and, you know, sort of put down for later dates and, and have a little uh, toy with. So as much as we say we've 12 uh, stills within the distillery, we only really have 10 that are producing spirit for Freelsa and we've got two that are doing their own thing for experimentation, uh, which is, you know, sort of, as a distiller, I can imagine it's just your best playground ever. But, you know, sort of, as I said, Brian is the master distiller, has been the master distiller at Glenfiddich for many, many a year. And those two classic notes of apple and pear, once we get down to the sweet smoke, you'll see that um, sort of picked up uh, again. And, you know, sort of, it's almost a little bit of a, it's almost, I don't know whether it's a doff the hat or whether it's his own personal sort of palette. It just sort of leans that way and lo looks to bring out these things from casks. Um, but I but I love that it's in there and I love that it has that, that connection between uh, between sort of master distiller and sort of almost its, its sister malt. We got some uh, some really great <clears throat> comments coming in there with the, the little bit of brininess. There's lots of agreements after your comment on the the or the original comment on the bananas. This ripe bananas, this foamy bananas, um, spicy overdried fruit, a slight citrus finish. 100 percent to get that myself. Yeah, uh, Duncan says very dry finish. Um, Martin says a little briny. Jay says candle wax, boiled sweets, and dry salty element to it. Definitely licorice, all sorts, and Granny Smiths. Uh, much more fruit with water. Um, so no, that was some great, great tasting notes there. Absolutely smashing. It is a, a gorgeous drama, I must say. Candle wax oh. was an interesting one. Candle wax I never thought of before, and I actually. So, the weird things that I do, uh, I've actually had a candle wax infused cocktail before. As you do. And, uh, and they, they, it, it, was a, it was a wonderful, really well-balanced drink. And I made the mistake of asking if I could try the candle wax infusion on its own. That is a flavor that will never leave me. Um, it is wonderful in small measures. In large measures, it was just other world. It was way, way, way too much. Um, you know, very, very small sort of fractions for that. But yes, now that you've said candle wax, absolutely brings me back to that. I think that's a really nice tasting note. That actually, if you'd indulge me for a second, that reminds me of a, of a number of years ago, um, previous life when I was in hospitality management, managing this bar, and we had these candles that were like a uh, cup shaped glass, but they had a, a, the candle was sunk into them, obviously. And uh, this one fella, we're, we're near closing up about 20 minutes late, late in a quiet midweek, and this fella comes in absolutely pissed, and he sits down in the corner, and he straight away falls asleep. So I went down, and he you know, seemed fairly harmless, so I went down just to tap him to wake him up, and I tapped him, he woke him up, and he clearly had that. I'm sure a lot of us have been there where you're kind of a bit drunk and, and not sure where you are. So I woke up, and he looked around, and he was like, oh, crap, you know? So he was, wasn't rude or aggressive or anything. And I said, sorry, pal, I think you, you need to go. So he went, yeah, yeah, no problem. And he picked up the candle, and he necked it. Because he just thought, I don't know if he just assumed that, you know, he must have had an empty glass in front of him. So he's like, yeah, I'll finish my drink and go, neck the candle, and out the door he went. Oh, <laughs> I'll never forget that moment. Oh, man. I don't, I, I don't think in, in 14, 15 years of working behind bars, I don't think I ever had anyone, sorry, 10 to 11 years of working behind bars, I don't think I ever had anyone quite that, uh, quite that lost. <laughs> I can, because I'm obviously, I, you know, I mean, uh, there's a great comment in the chat saying Luke stopped telling the story about me, but the, um, I kind of, I kind of had to empathize because I, I, I know that feeling of when you've had it, even if you're not absolutely drunk but if you've been if you have a pal's house or something after the pub and you have a couple of drinks and you doze off and there's that moment where your brain forgets that you're not in your own comfortable space yeah. so you wake up and you're like right you know quickly assess the world okay i'm in a place i shouldn't be i'm going to finish my drink and leave and you know there's this glass thing holding a candle you know i don't know there's this weird logic to it but there you go uh so much better for me with a drop of water says paul we'll get back on to the the the, the tasting um i'm gonna add, add another bit of water actually because it is it is a really yeah. really interesting one this is probably i did like the the virgin oak but this is probably my favorite so um for everyone listening do do not necessarily say now because we'll go through it at the end but it'll be interesting to see what how people rate it um i like that that is a particularly nice nice little sample really really nice 
And from that, we will go to, to the refill bourbon. And, uh, and once again, always worth looking at this uh, in terms of a, a, a color comparison. Your refill bourbon is going to have sort of very, very little sort of interaction. Your refill bourbon, a lot of flavor has been taken out of the, the oak. A lot of the, the coloration certainly has been taken out of the oak. Um, there is already, you know, sort of that, that whiskey been in had all that interaction. And this, this is this is in more or less just to rest um, this this element of the whiskey. Uh, this is absolutely going to be the 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 anti point to to the Hudson. Um, this will absolutely take a drop of water. But yes, Jeff has pointed out in the chat lots of new makes spirit in the nose, and hundred percent there's lots of new makes spirit on that nose because because. This has only been in refill bourbon. It's probably not been in for a great amount of time. This is going to be as close as we try to the uh, to the to the new make uh, this evening. Uh, it's going to be, you know, sort of obviously it's, it's going to be watered down uh, slightly, but um, but yeah, the interaction it's had with the oak is going to have had minimal effect. And so, you know, those those classic new make new make notes of sort of really ripe under ripe fruits really. Mm. Jay's been popping off with the, with the tasty notes tonight because he's nose of burning soldering iron. That's uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing how the tasty notes become more descriptive on the fourth tram. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Duncan says biscuity, which I think is is accurate. That that's that kind of mm. is going to that new make that youthfulness, that spirit coming through. Yeah. Yeah. So Paul Paul said almost tequila like, and that's that's what you're going to get from a sort of really young spirit. A lot of tequila sort of will be bottled barely you sort of about three months so you're gonna get a lot of sort of new make when you're distilling anything it's gonna have you know sort of like certain certain classic uh, uh certain classic new make notes hence rubber uh, absolutely grappa once again relatively unaged mm. grappa is an interesting one yeah 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 sort of a little bit a little bit of that sulfur but yeah just just classic new make sort of under ripe fruit Lots of smoke, a little bit of spice, lots of smoke in the palate. Loads of smoke. Nah, nah. I would disagree with Jay there. I think that's unfair on the whiskey. Um, <clears throat> we had a, yeah, there was a, a... Actually, never mind. <laughs> I digress. There's no more, no more, no need for more distractions. <laughs> but yes, uh, yeah. A little bit of biscuit there. Absolutely a little bit of biscuit. A lot of smoke. Um, quite sort of classic peat, but a little bit more round than uh, you'd anticipate for something that's quite so almost raw. Um, Duncan uh, seemed very dry. I found the virgin oak probably a little bit drier than that. Um, but I get, I, I absolutely get where you're coming from. Um, <laughs> Roger, Roger in the chat is, uh, is 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 trying to trying to outdo you, I suppose. A slight smell of burnt fingernail. Uh, I think you may have been too close to the candle, Roger. <laughs> yeah, spot on. Um, surprise, surprisingly smooth on the palate. Says I think that's a bit unfair, Paul, as well. Um, the Colin says smells like chemical fire. Um, that's interesting. Um, I, I think it's, it's 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 not a bad dram at all, you know. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's probably is a bit younger. I mean, obviously, traditionally, as in you get that younger flavors of it, because obviously, I imagine traditionally the the kind of second the second fill is you is reserved for for further aging, you know, so that so that you don't overage um, a spirit. Um, so in terms of the, I know you said at the start you don't know the exact percentage makeup, but how much of the of this compared to the first three do you think ends up in the final? Um, product i would imagine the sort of the virgin oak and the first fill bourbon sort of come together and um, with a little bit of the hudson i don't think it takes a lot of the hudson to to sort of add that sweetness i think the sweetness is so distinct in the hudson that it's that it's going to sort of carry through i can imagine the three of them being combined together and then the refill bourbon being added to to add that sort of smoky backbone uh, to really bring the the peat level to where we want it to be um, you know, it's kind of the, the, the Hudson's here to bring sweet, uh, the, the, uh, the sort of sweetness to where it wants to be, 
the refills where we want the smoke to where we want it to be and the two in the middle are sort of basically the the, the flavor profile the building blocks the the core of the spirit so i don't think there's a whole lot there um i think it's uh, i think it's delicately played with and certainly when we try the final spirit now um we will probably find that um uh, it's going to taste a little bit less peated than you would uh, than you would find uh, or you would expect normally, but only because we're just moving from that refill bourbon, um, which has that uh, that that really sort of classic high it's sort of peat level. Uh, I have just rinsed out my glass uh, rather than fired myself uh, full another whiskey. I was gonna I was gonna drink the water there, <laughs> but uh, that might not look so great on camera. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> we had a question there from uh, Jay about the, the SPPM idea conceived and how it actually is quantified. So uh, I, I've got a little, I've got a little something unusual here, actually. Uh, well, unusual now. So this is the original Ailsa Bay. We are, we are about to sample the, the final sample of the evening is the Ailsa Bay 1.2 sweet smoke. Um, but this is the original one launched in 2016. Uh, for those of you that, that, that you know, like fairly, fairly quick at math, given the distillery only opened in 2007, this is a maximum of nine years old. Um, there is no age statement on any of our whiskies. Um, we are specifically looking to to not talk about age statement across LCB as a whole. Um, it's all about the the science, the tech the ways that we can make whiskey a little bit more interesting, sometimes a little bit more approachable. Um, but yeah, we can we can do really, really interesting things with whiskey, you know, sort of this is, it's a, it's a, else is a great, certainly the 1.2 is a great whiskey, both for introducing people to a peated category that they might not have entered into before. But it can also, if you really want to dig down uh, into the, the way whiskey is created and what how it's made and what we do um it is a bit of a whiskey geeks whiskey you know sort of we've got a uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, the detail uh, that we can do on sort of blockchain uh, that we've used from sort of almost day one of the distillery so it's really really cool um we're hoping to to bring that more out into the world in terms of you know sort of at some point we will be able to uh, there's a QR code in every bottle, uh, which will give you some some really interesting notes, but um, or, or really interesting information, uh, sort of like bottle date and stuff like that. But um, at some point, we will we'll be able to tell you which field the grain in that particular bottle has come from, because we have that information to hand. We just need to get it in a way that goes to the consumer. Like we've got some really really interesting stuff going on, but we wanted a way for the consumers to to understand peats part per million and indeed sweetness parts per million uh, in a way that was sort of relevant to them. Uh, some uh, whiskies have done this before. We are the only whiskey that measures it after distillation. That's a huge, huge thing because anybody that knows about distillation will tell you that if you measure peats part per million before distillation, that can you you can take a massively peated malt and turn it into something and, and the other end that is relatively unpeated. Your peat part per million before distillation has can have relatively no effect on the on the end product and the end peat part per million in the end product. So we put the peat part per million of the end product on the bottle, and we're the only people that do that. Um, that was really important to us because in the long run, we want to see a, a sort of category or, you know, sort of a, a range, certainly for Ilsa Bay, where we go, oh, you like that amount of peat, but you like that amount of sweetness. So you can sort of like this one, this, you know, it's like edition number four will be the, the perfect malt for you because it's got peat, uh, peat part per million and sweetness part per million that's right in your sweet spot. And we know that's going to be the same as the other bottles because we measure it after distillation, not before distillation because then it all gets skewed and it's all a little bit, oh, well, that's peer than that and that's peer than that. But um, it's all about it's all about finding that balance. And, and Brian wanted to give as much information as possible to, to the consumer and just really uh, engage them in a way that they hadn't been engaged before and going, oh, right, well, this is, this is you know, so as much information as we have. So, you know, we can give that to you, you know, so like quite confidently. And if you want to really research into it and dig into it, then feel free. Um, but if you don't, if you just want to use it as a as a sort of as a guide as to as to where your palate sits, then that's great as well. Um, and that's not immediately, you know, sort of going to have an effect on on 
1.2 sweet smoke that we're going to try. Um, but once we have a range, and you know, it's like we are a family-owned distillery who have, uh, you know, sort of a family-owned company um, who think in genuinely think in generations rather than P and Ls year to year. Um, yeah, once this becomes a six or seven bottle range, you know, whether that's in 20 years or in 40 years or in 50 years or in 60 years, um, we'll have a, you know, you'll be able to have a much better idea of, you know, where your where your palate sits. And uh, yeah, thinking long term is an amazing, is an amazing asset to be able to have as a family owned company. And and and, in, and essential in in whiskey, you know, because <laughs> you yeah. have to you have to think long term. And I know it's it's it sounds like a cliche, but especially with younger distilleries, you don't have that that luxury because you have to. You know, we see that with with all these distilleries producing gins and vodkas and rushing young whiskey to market because you know you you have to, as you say, that worry about that P and L. Um, because it was interesting. There was a comment further back about about um moving away from age statements, which age statements, which I think is good. You know, I think. Um, I'd agree with with the comment from I think it was Nottingham Whiskey Shop that yeah you know we we do get too bogged down in age statements and is it does it say single malt on the bottle do you know it, it it's it should be about obviously you want to stick to tradition so I'm not saying totally rip up the the page but but yeah it's about flavor as well um the a few more questions or comments in there um uh we got giving more information to consumers quite uh interesting useful looking forward to it techie whiskey says Steph, um, Paul has asked, is the post PPM measure you just spoke about there unique to Ailes of Bay? So post parts per million, um, in terms of, so, so we've got two readings on there. We've got uh, Pete's part per million and we've got sweetness part per million. Pete's part per million uh, is done by a two, probably, I'm not going to put a number on it. I was, I was about to there, but I'll get called out, no doubt. Uh, it's done by uh, several distilleries, uh, one in particular that's uh, probably uh, kind of a little bit renowned for it. Uh, but Pete's Part Per Million, after distillation, was only done by one other distillery, uh, and they've since removed it from their bottle. Um, so, yeah, so post-distillation, we are the only distillery, as far as I'm aware, in Scotch whiskey, certainly that was true a year ago, um, that, that have post-distillation Pete's Part Per Million, and we're the only uh, only whiskey total that does sweetness part per million. That's something that was created by Brian. Uh, basically, he takes out the, um, uh, the the specific chemicals that are associated in the palate with sweetness. Um, so whether that's, as I said earlier, vanillins, which is where sort of we get the flavor profile of vanilla from, and that's vanillin is 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 found traditionally in oak, which is why oak, the heavily oak things taste like vanilla. Um, but yeah. Any of these, uh, any of these chemical compounds that are associated to our palate with sweetness, we have uh, we have determined the the volume of them in the in in the in the finished product specifically, um, and and put that on the label as a number. Mm. No, it's fascinating stuff, and obviously maturation mm. stuff is going to um, vary that, and and there's all sorts of factors, but it's it's brilliant that that transparency and that clarity is amazing. I, you were mentioning other brands and stuff we won't get into, but this obviously the, the Octomore range is the most famous for the P, for the PPM. Yep. Um, and what's what's interesting is those you know some of those Octomores that say it's two hundred and seventy five um, parts per million. Now I'm not going to lie, I love the Octomore range, but some Arab bags taste smokier to me. You know, even though the yep. though scientifically the PPM you know is technically less or supposed to be less, um, but other whiskies, yeah, you know, uh, don't don't seem to taste. So it's it's very it's the same with ABVs. Obviously, it's a scientific fact that the alcohol is going to be some level but some you really taste it and some you don't so it's all um going to vary like uh, i mean obviously it is an exact science but it's not an exact science in terms of reading the bottle and and knowing exactly what you're going to receive off it which is part of the joy in 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 doing these we've had loads of questions about the the next uh, or if you're ever going to release some of these the single casks um uh, which i like the reply earlier on where we have we do have a few more of these on sale so yeah buy them while they're there so you obviously won't be able to join us live again but you yep. can still drink the whiskeys they're still on sale on the website um but in terms of what's coming down the line for ales bay is there is there any plans you can let us know about as we actually might be a good segue to come into the next the final dram uh, i would really love to tell you everything and anything um i know of one project that is underway uh, but that is a very long-term project and that is about um uh, specific portions of the, of the distillate that we're taking off. 
Um, so, so yeah, so that is that is ongoing. Um, uh, but I know nothing of uh, another iteration. Um, as I said, I don't foresee ever, uh, or certainly not in the not in the short to medium term, uh, else to be looking at uh, anything with an age statement. I think uh, it's it's a different story we're trying to tell with Elsa. Um, but as we are laying down stock all the time, uh, we are laying down a lot of stock. Um, so there will certainly be things uh, coming coming in the medium term. Um, but nothing immediately in the short term uh, that I've been informed of, anyway. But yes, uh, uh, yeah. As far as as far as I'm aware, nothing nothing immediately. Um, interestingly, though, as I said, I I have the as, as the, that is all I have the original bottling. Um, you can still. I saw one of these went for forty five pounds the other day. I think that's a a bit of a bargain. A lovely try alongside that. And um, so yeah. Um, we watch. actually had a comment at the, at the very start that uh, I didn't um, engage with when I when I should have. Sometimes you bank these to kind of come back to them because of where, what we're chatting about. But it was about when you held up that bottle. Someone had said that they uh, their friend tried to use the the, the top as a as a tea um, in golf. <laughs> so I don't know I don't know how, how they got on, uh, but I think it was Alan um, had had said that. So if, um, I, I can't remember if you said you did or didn't know how they got on Alan so um, if you do have an update whether it's now or if you could ask them and come back to us um, and let us know uh, that was a, a, a great comment. Um, Katzan uh, asked about the influence of, of the, the, the lineup tonight and, and why we chose this running order. Um, she said that the, the sweet smokes were lightweight but I suppose we kind of had to finish the sweet smoke because this is the whole idea where these are the components that make up the, the sweet smoke um but just if you want to obviously we went through we've gone through it all now but if you want to go what your logic was you mentioned about the virgin oak being introducing people to, to peated whiskies and that kind of ideas what was the kind of the kind of flow um the thoughts behind that for cat there so the the flow this evening was um to take anybody that uh you know so i'm, I'm aware we've got we've got a, a whiskey audience tonight but there is a trepidation when it comes to smoke um, with a lot of people in terms of uh, the, you know, sort of that, that experience they've had, as I mentioned before, um, maybe have sort of kept themselves away from peated single malt uh, or peated whiskey in general uh, because they're not a particular fan of it. The, the process this evening, the order this evening was, was very much trying to sort of guide people in um, to, you know, sort of from something not particularly offensive, you know, it's a little bit uh, very, very, very sweet uh, to start with. And then to sort of a little bit more classic, a little bit more classic with some peat, the, the refill bourbon, which, you know, sort of, I think if we started with that, then it would have all gone sideways. Uh, and then the, the amalgamation of all those four together uh, bring us to this uh, lovely last dram that we have. Marvelous. So, so now that now that we've come to the to the last stop on the journey, do you want to uh, to talk us through this? It's it's much sweeter on the nose than I, I remembered um, last time I tried this. Yeah. So on the nose, we're gonna get we're gonna get that honey from the the quarter cask, uh, you know, sort of, and, and that's gonna that's gonna come through in the, the sort of salt caramel finish. Um, we're gonna get that that building blocks from the virgin oak and the first fill bourbon. There's you know like a, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of honey, a little bit of campfire smoke. The refill bourbon isn't really coming through too, you know, so like uh, too harshly in the nose. You know, it's it's hidden away there in the background. But what I really like about this, I really like just a little bit of vanilla there, almost a little bit of white chocolate. If anybody has uh, any any milky bar in the house, leave a bit of uh, leave a bit of the Elsa Bay tonight uh, and go and get yourself some milky bar and have it alongside Elsa. It's the most wonderful sort of tasting side by side. I really, really love it. Um, this malt loves white chocolate and it loves raspberries. Uh, but those are the two. As, as many sort of whiskies that go out there and it's like, oh, try this like salted dark chocolate. And you know, it's like dark chocolate is a really lovely combination. No, try this. Try this with white chocolate. Try this with with loads of vanilla. Try this with raspberry, and it's a, a lovely sort of side by side. Mm. On the palate, you've got perfectly balanced peat and sweetness, which is what this single malt is all about. It's a really, you know, sort of, especially after trying that, that refill bourbon, 
It's a really sort of a, a nice approachable peat, um, but it's still got that, that little bit of apple, that little bit of pear. Uh, yeah, a little bit of, mm, a little bit spiciness in there, but it's just easing its way into sort of sulfur on the finish. And then that refill bourbon comes through in the end, that, that smoke comes through, that's your sort of lingering flavor, which is probably why the, the Milky Bar works so well with it. It's probably why the vanilla works with it. You're sort of reintroducing that vanilla uh, into, the, into, that into that palette. Mm. Little water in the mouth, opens up massively. Oh, loads and loads of flavor in there. Those green apples, like smoky green apples, sort of like, like that campfire char. Uh, yeah, quite a uh, uh, marshmallows, like toasted marshmallows, almost sort of really charred, beautiful marshmallows. Mm. It's all. It's all in there, and then there's a little bit of orange, a little bit of almond coming through. That's probably the licorice notes that we got earlier. A little mm. bit of almond on the on the finish. Paul, oily and tropical. So that's so that's one of the things. That's, I find the the tropical notes. There's there's definitely coconut in there when you hunt for it, but I think the 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 I, I, it's probably just my palate. I just lose a little bit of the, the a little bit of the sort of almost pineapple notes you had from the Virgin in the, in the, in the Hudson, but it's they're in there somewhere. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's extraordinary. And as Paul's Paul's comment on pineapple uh, is a great one, and and Alan obviously says it's it, you know you commented on the marshmallows, but he's, he talks about how balanced it is in that comment as well, um, and it re it really is. I mean, it, you really do. Obviously, it's cliche and it's, it's obvious thing to state after trying all these bits, but you do kind of pick out, as a comment said further back, that you pick out the licorice, you pick out different bits. Um, this is a great way of becoming more more intimate with uh, with the whiskey. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Absolutely, everything that you've tried in the in the little cast samples prior, that's all going to be there in the end. In, in the end, in the finished product, it's just a question of you know, sort of if you can if you can pinpoint it. You know, sort of some are more dominant than others. Absolutely, you know, sort of you get the smoke, you get the coconut, you know, sort of you get the vanilla. All of that's in you get the spice. Um, but yeah, stuff like the pineapple, stuff like the licorice, they're in the final product. Um, you know, sort of you know, sort of you might not get that in the first sip, but if you have the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and then the second dram. It, it opens up coats of mouth and it's uh yeah it's a it's a wonderfully complex spirit um but it's absolutely i, I love 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 peated malt as i was sort of even sort of as i was uh as i was sort of just going to bars uh lagavulin was one of my favorite spirits and uh but it would never be sort of if i was sitting at home it would never be something that i went to grab off the shelf you know so i get very much felt that you know sort of the right environment you had to be in for something like that whereas this this is absolutely a peated malt that I would, I would have or I do have uh sort of sitting in the sitting on the shelf at home and you know sort of on a you know sort of on a, well, Friday or Saturday or Thursday or uh whichever day it is now um Any day beginning with tea to, yeah today today and tomorrow um <clears throat> the yeah, I mean, uh, Nottingham in the in the chat there says uh, I can taste everything that's been said. Am I transcending? But um, David came back before before I, I got the chance to comment on it. Was that that's it's true that that the danger of these tastings is how suggestive, you know, like you 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 teed up um, licorice before um, yeah. the the uh, what was that the third dram or the fourth dram, and uh, and straight away everyone was like licorice, you know. So it is. I mean, obviously there is enough there that it's you can go off the walls with it. Um, but there definitely is that idea that we're all kind of we're all obviously experiencing the same dram and dancing around the same kind of taste notes. And when someone kind of vocalizes it, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I see what you mean, I see what you mean. Um, so there is a danger of that. But but all that aside, as you as you just you know eloquently put it yourself, this is a, a great dram and it's a it's a great dram for for drinking. Um, someone did comment saying sweet smoke was or further back. Can't remember who it was saying sweet smoke wasn't uh, was a bit deceiving as of, of a name because because it's kind of peter than you'd expect from from the way the bottle is and the way. The sweet smokers. Could you talk more on the on the bottle design? Because Alan Mitchell came back to me and said that the 
it was a a ball marker, not a tea, that it was for the whiskey. Um, so yeah, could you talk? So maybe the the the, the fact that it's forty eight point nine, um, which yep. is which is random. <laughs> well, obviously it's not random, but it's but it's different. Um, and yeah, the, the kind of the bottle design, the cap, the the idea that it's sweet smoke is right. It doesn't look like it's going to be the kind of punch you in the face piece that that you can sometimes get from it. Yeah. So there's a lot to do with the whiskey that's, you know, sort of it, it, being that's a William Grant's on product, you you immediately think it's ingrained in tradition, but then you immediately look at the bottle and it's it's certainly not like Balvenie, it's certainly not like uh, Glenfiddich. It's it's a bottle that's specifically trying to tell its own story. Um, we have moved slightly from the original sort of 1.1 and uh, somebody did ask about the, the flavor difference and I'll drop that in a minute. Um, but yeah, the, the 1.1 had, um, had, our, had our granite top which was a uh, yeah a really lovely sort of talking point. Uh, Gervin is um, I just across, across the water from Gervin. Sorry, is is Ailsa Craig the uh, a, a, a massive granite island, uh, which is where we get uh, the curling stones from in Scotland, um, and carved out of the the top of the curling stones where you put the handle is these little round nuggets, and we used to have them at, on the top of uh, every bottle. Uh, a little bit of granite from Ilse Creek, which is what the uh, distillery is named after, because you can see it from the distillery. Um, unfortunately, trying to be uh, an energy efficient and energy neutral distillery, and then asking uh, people to lug around these bottles with a big whole load of granite on top uh, is not particularly energy efficient. Um, so that's something that we have changed from sort of the first bottle to the second bottle. Um, the bottle might not scream smoke, but uh, the bottle certainly doesn't, you know, sort of, it doesn't scream lowland either. It doesn't scream space It screams, for me, it screams modern and it seems, it screams interesting. Um, it's definitely something that uh, sort of stands out in a whiskey shelf, stands out in a back bar. Um, and as soon as you put that down, you know, sort of beside other, you know, sort of, you put that down beside, uh, well, let's take a lowland malt and a, and an Isla malt, um, you're going to have, you know, sort of uh, a Lagrulin or Lefroy next to that, and a Glen uh, Kinchy. That is going to be a, a bottle that you're going to go, okay, that's got something different in it. That looks different, feels different, and in the palate, it's different. Um, mm -hmm. It's not one, it's not the other. It's something unique of its own. It's not, you know, it's like that sulfur that I think we were talking about earlier. It's much more campfire. It's much more sort of. Uh, charcoal it's much more uh barbecue um rather than and not sort of barbecue you know sort of like sticky american barbecue it's much more barbecue smoke um you know it's like that that you, <laughs> the smell you have in your hair when you wake up after having a barbecue um you know sort of it's that flavor that that proper campfire smoke rather than you know sort of the um the, the, the this it's sulfury, you know, say the TCP that you expect from the West Coast, or indeed the, the floral light nature that you expect from, from the lowland. Um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily scream smoke to you, but uh, but it doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't quite sit suppose, in the norm either. It's the, uh, for me, actually, now that as you were saying there and describing um, that, I suppose for me personally, it was the the idea that sweet is, uh, is can be lit literally, you know, sweet is in the, the taste. But it can also be something that's that's gentle, that's elegant. Do you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a leading term that 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 can be interpreted in in, in different ways, like you know. Um, but but yeah, so I suppose that's that's for the for on the smoke bit because you were saying it doesn't scream Peter, but it doesn't scream Lowland. But um, I suppose on the smoke bit, on descriptively, sweet smoke sounds like it could be a gentle wisp, you know, sweet sweet kisses. <laughs> you know, it's like. Um, but but yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's it's a good whiskey. We can't we can't deny it. And um, I suppose now is the perfect time for me to add in the uh, discount code that that you're all going to get. Um, so everyone who's uh, joined tonight can can enjoy fifteen percent off that that Ailsa Bay one point two. Um, so I'm just going to pop that in the chat. There it is. I'll send it out with the recording tomorrow as well. But it's W S. 15 VTAB. So anyone listening can can jump on on whiskeyshop.com now and uh, and enjoy a, a discount on that. 
Um, we won't finish straight away before we, as we kind of wrap up now and wind, wind down. There is a uh, Lafroy and Highland Park peated whiskey tasting um, on sale at the moment. Um, sorry, uh, Callum, to, to plug another brand. Oh, no. but, <laughs> um, the, the Digital Drams um, is next one is on the 20th. Um, so just after Father's Day. Um, so if you're if you're interested, if you've enjoyed tonight, then do 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 pick up that because obviously that's continuing the peated theme. And that's kind of a peated cast strength with a, a, a regular Highland Park followed by a cast strength and then a Lefroy 10 followed by Lefroy 10 cast strength. So you've got that peated and cast strength. So it ticks all the boxes. Um, and Jay has said there, Ailes of Bay, 10 out of 10. Thank you very much. And it is, it is really a great, a great drama. And at the price it is, uh, particularly with the discount, I would definitely recommend people picking it up. Is there anything you wanted to add yourself um, there, Callum? Or is there any questions that anyone wants to jump in? If you want to jump in, folks, your questions and your, your favorite order uh, and taste the, you know, kind of comments, closing comments there, uh, while Callum um, gives his kind of last uh, last thoughts, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, very much open, open to questions. Uh, and yeah, love to know everybody's favourite. I think the Virgin Oak is coming through quite strongly. Um, yeah, I was, as I said, I, I really love sort of the, the the first three that we tried tonight are all really, really interesting. Uh, even, even the refill bourbon is really, really interesting, especially if you're into that sort of like heavily heated uh, number. But I think the, the first three are all sort of you know, sort of on, on their own standalone are really, really beautiful. Uh, but I do love the the skill and how how it comes together. Um, somebody asked about the the forty. Uh, sorry, Luke, it was yourself. The forty eight point nine. You said that's a little bit unusual. It's it's a nod to the the uh, infinitesimally small uh, nuances that we, that we can go into in LCB. You know, so I'm sure they could put a a much more uh, for a, a, a number of more decimal places after the the the, the forty eight point nine, um, but yeah, it's, it's just a dot of the hat to that. Um, we are, you know, sort of a, a very traditional whiskey doing things in a very non traditional way, and when those you know sort of those traditional uh, understandings and knowledge come together, you know, sort of, as I said, hundred and well, eighteen eighty seven to now, hundred and forty years of distilling experience. Um, when we take that and add that to the the technology that we have today, that you know, so William Grant didn't have in 1887, it's a it's a wonderful amalgamation. I think the the whiskey itself speaks to it. I think it's a phenomenal drop. Uh, and uh, you know, sort of, I I have a lot of uh, a, a number of uh, spirits that I work with uh, on a daily basis, and Ilse Bay is absolutely is something that I can take out of my bag and for any consumer, any bartender just find it really intriguing and, and beautifully tasty um there's just so much to it and like i said uh if you if you know a whiskey geek and they don't know else to be get them involved in it or if you know somebody who likes their whiskey but doesn't really like peated whiskey or says they've had a bad experience this is the this is a whiskey to go have a little try of that and you know sort of uh, that that's your 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 doorway that's your your opening your gateway, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, thank you for everybody for now. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't correcting you. I was going <laughs> no, like no. agreeing with you. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 fantastic. And and, and like not, not to be facetious, you were saying how much you enjoyed your job at the very start. And um and speaking from someone who works in the industry, it's 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 always a lot easier when you're you're hawking a good product, like you know. Um, and I think you are you are here, so so definitely. Um, first fill bourbon um is, is definitely and refill is coming up a lot more than I thought it would, considering how much, uh, in terms of the comments of people's favourite um, here, considering how how frequently the Virgin Oak um, has popped up. Um, I'm, I'm also not joking when I say that there, there is still packs available um, here uh, if you want to buy more and taste these again. Um, that's also aimed at, at David's comment there that the, that wins the Hudson uh, back in stock. Um, so definitely. Um, Ian says now, sorry, he's got a comment on stock. Um, uh, Hudson may be relatively limited, um, as far as I'm aware. There's not a whole lot of it coming into the UK at the moment uh, for multiple reasons. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I I can only speak to a little bit of that. Uh, Luke, you might you might know more from your end uh, for for your specific business, but um, but yeah, certainly on a UK wide basis, there's not a lot of Hudson going around. Yeah, I, I'm actually I'm not sure, but I I can I can I can fi- try and find out for you, David, and see, um, and see there is there is definitely a stock issue on on the Elza Bay, um, online. Maybe it's just the the speed in which people have, have clicked through, but we'll we'll have a look at that and we'll get that sorted, 
um for you so apologies um about that guys it's, it's actually out of my control um as nottingham says there's plenty in nottingham and this is the thing that's a web that's on on web but there's plenty in in the shop so if you're near a, a whiskey shop you can always get in get in there and grab it um so yeah definitely um pulse is first uh first for me building a bottle from scratch um so he's enjoyed the, the tasting formats that's that's fantastic um there's some great comments um there that's that have come in this there's probably too much to read out but but just wanted to thank um everyone for for yeah for 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 joining tonight and uh and Callum particularly yourself for for talking us through what's been a fantastic tasting thank you very much very welcome folks thank you very much for coming along and uh, i hope you've all enjoyed yourselves i know i have brilliant and if there's anything we didn't get to or any questions you have just send me an email folks to the to the same email you'd have got the the link from or that i'm going to now send out the discount code to and uh, and we'll 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 get that addressed so brilliant um thanks very much and we'll see you all again soon. Um, cheers, Callum. Thank you, folks.